to another edition of Reptile Fight Club. Um, I'm Justin Dulander. I've got with me very good Chuck. How you yeah, doing? Yeah, the people, Chuck. <laughs> What's up, people? <laughs> All right, well, um, how are things? You good? They're good. They're good. I'm excited for this fight. I, uh, yeah. I actually just uh, got uh, my first couple of eggs of, of William's Eye, so this is a fitting, um, you know, kind of a fitting fight. Uh, so, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, very cool. good. Very good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I've just been, uh, plugging away at the book. We got, I got the Sploda, uh, chapter laid out for figures. So that should be, I, I still <laughs> see Nick. Like I need this picture. I need that picture. Yeah. He's like, he's like, <laughs> we don't have any pictures. I'm like, dude, I've got a, a folder. Full of them. <laughs> you have access to that. Just look in the folder. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we'll, we're good. getting there. We'll get it done. But yeah, a few, yeah. a few fun changes at the last minute to, to revamp things. And, and, uh, so that's required a little bit of, uh, effort in the All, ways always right I like i mean it. yeah yeah uh, always a delay kind of, so yeah kind of the I, nature I apologize of the beast. again but anybody uh, looking forward to it or waiting for us we're we should have it you know pretty soon <laughs> let's just cool. leave it there nice. all right well without further ado we'll bring our guests on I'm, I'm excited to have him on the show here and uh uh, I guess to, to bring it into context, Chuck was talking about William's eye, uh, that Frank Payne is kind of the master of William's eye and a few yeah. other species. He's kind of taken those projects on and, and done very well with them and, and, you know, uh, shared some information and, and, you know, educated us on how to keep these animals in, in a productive manner. And so, yeah, we're, we're excited to have, uh, with us Frank Payne. So welcome to the show. Welcome. Hey, Hey guys, thanks for having me. Happy to yeah. be here. All right. Why don't you uh, take a minute or two to introduce yourself and kind of how you fit into herpes culture? Sure. Uh, so like you guys said, my name is Frank Payne. I've been involved in herpetoculture for pretty much my entire life. As long as I can remember since I was a little kid, I've been keeping and uh, breeding reptiles since I was in the single digits and catching lizards <laughs> in Houston, Texas. Sounds um, very familiar. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like how everybody starts. Right. And, uh, I was extremely lucky growing up to have a mom that encouraged that and fostered that passion. And I had a, a bathroom. We had a, we had a spare bathroom and that I converted into a, my lizard room and there's an old claw tub in it that I built a wooden rack around it and had, you know, aquariums all over there and screen cages and everything. So that was all through high school or is mostly just like the keep two of everything, bred a few yeah. things, but mostly just keeping stuff and enjoying it and, did it through college uh, a little bit, and then right after college, I uh, became a zookeeper uh, for Clyde okay. Peeling's Reptiland, which uh, sounds like a little roadside attraction, which it used to be in the '60s, but now it is a it's been an AZA facility for many years, and it has one of the top five reptile collections in the country. Um, nice. Clyde Peeling uh, and his son are some of the the most important people uh, in the AZA when it comes to to reptile. So I was lucky to work with them for quite a few years through college, after college. And then even after I transitioned uh, to being a science teacher, mm -hmm. um, I worked with them uh, in the summers and vacations and stuff. Um, and I have been a biology teacher for the past 15 years. And it seems like every year the hobby increases more and more to the point where it isn't now a business where my wife works full time, you know, for the family business at home. Oh, nice. And, and yeah, it, it's, we've been really lucky the past couple of years and it keeps expanding uh, and cool. doing well. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm just super lucky that I get to, you know, teach kids about science all day and then come home and work with the animals that I love and share that with everybody. Nice. Was she always into reptiles or is this something that you kind of brought? You know? Yeah. <laughs> it it kind of came as a package when she married yeah. me and, you know, like when we were dating and everything, and of course I had plenty of critters and, she always thought they were interesting, but, and she's an, definitely an animal lover um, and has not, is not one of those people that dislikes reptiles at all. So she always found them cool, but not like something that she would personally keep. And then just like more and more year after year, she yeah. grew to appreciate them. And now that it's turned into a, a full fledged family business, she's really into it. She really cares about the animals. And you know, I, I was, yeah, I was, I was a senior herpetology keeper for a number of years and I've trained over a dozen people and, and yeah. she's one of the best people that I've ever trained, um, which is just absolutely awesome. Um, so cool. I'm, 
I'm super lucky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's hard. That's a rare gem, right? <laughs> In the yeah, for sure. Yeah. But very cool. I, I, my wife is kind of this, a similar thing. She, she doesn't uh, do too much with the reptiles, but if I go out of town for an extended period of time, she's, you know, prepared to go uh, feed or, or water and things oh, like that's that. Great. So yeah, it's nice having a, a, a supportive spouse in that regard. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've heard horror stories of the opposite. So, you know, I'm yeah. super mm -hmm. we're lucky that we have, you know, the opposite. <laughs> Especially yeah, being a teacher, sure. right, Frank? I, I'm sure you come home just spent. I know. Oh, I'm so, dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I was talking talking to you guys about you know like picking a day for this, and I'm like, you know, basically any day but Friday because I come home on Friday and I'm just I'm I'm dead. Yeah, you know, like I I taught high high school for eleven years, and then when we moved to a different city. I took a, I had to take a middle school job. And so I, I work with 12 and 13 year olds in, in uh, an inner city school. So yeah. <laughs> by Friday, I'm done. I'm like, yeah. let me sit on the couch and leave me alone for yeah. until Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah. My, my wife is a seventh grade, uh, teacher in, in a low, low performing area. So, uh, Oh, she knows she very knows. challenging. Yes, yes, absolutely. And she wouldn't have it any other way, but yes, yeah. by, by the end of the day and the end of the week, she is done. <laughs> I am uh, incredibly proud of what I do. Um, yeah, I, yeah. It, it's a lot of people look look down on it, especially when it comes to like middle school as opposed to you know high school. Mm -hmm. um, but man, uh, I am extremely proud of what I do. But man, it takes a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it takes yeah, a lot absolutely. of energy. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah, Chuck and I both have uh, daughters around that age in, in middle school. And, yeah. and you know, I my daughter just kind of got an interest in reptiles, and she is just full in you know she's awesome she's going yeah. to the shows with me she's selling stuff she's learning all she can i mean she's just a sponge yeah. and it's been really really fun so i imagine you know teaching that age can be really rewarding in the in regards to you know they're they've got a lot of energy but they're also looking to yes. learn and and you know, uh, really. people always ask me what do i like better high school or middle school i'm like well i like the behaviors of high school better yeah. it's <laughs> yeah. high school's easier you uh -huh. know that like you can have grown-up conversations with them for the most part Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of them are very apathetic at that point, uh, yeah. especially like junior, senior year. But like the seventh graders, they're not apathetic at all. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I do um, is every Friday as a reward, as a positive incentive, I bring in a different animal from my collection at home. Oh, cool. And we, we call it Zoo Fridays. And I bring an animal mm -hmm. in that they get to see, you know, like sometimes endangered stuff, sometimes stuff that you would never see in a pet store, you know, and sometimes yeah. a blue tongue skink that they can hold. Yeah. yeah. You know, so that's that's a nice thing. Oh, yeah, that's, that's very cool. cool. That's Man, very I, cool. I would have yeah. killed for a teacher. I, I guess I did have a teacher like that in high school. My I, my AP biology teacher was fantastic. Um, um, cool. She actually led a led a uh, junior high um, science camp in the summer that I was a oh, part nice. of, and we were hiking along a trail, and I um, found a little baby. The group found a little baby rattlesnake, and I had the bright idea to pin it and show you know everybody the fangs and <laughs> oh, <laughs> thing, yeah. but, genius but move. The teacher loved that. Yeah. Well, yeah. she came up to me, and this is how I knew she was so cool. She came up to me, and she's like, um, you might hurt the snake. You better put it down. <laughs> I'm like, she wasn't worried awesome. so much about me. I'm sure she was, but she's like, she was yeah. worried that I was going to hurt the snake. Wow. You know, So that was yeah. pretty cool. And then I had her in yeah, high school cool. for AP biology, and she was just fantastic. She let me wow. set up like a science project looking at the effect of like acid rain on frog eggs, you know, and it, just so cool. cool. So help me just further that uh interest in in, in scientific research and you know and in, in biology yeah. in general but um awesome. specifically in reptiles she was you know supportive of that so and i i was cool. uh, lucky like you i had a mom and and dad that were very supportive and let me keep just about anything i brought home including different rattlesnakes and stuff oh wow kid. so um yeah i've i that's a that's a rare uh, group to be in, especially when you're in shows and you see all the yeah. kids that be like, oh, I'd, I'd love to have one, but my mom or my dad won't let me. Yeah. And yep. you know, it's kind of rough. So, yeah. yep, we got to count our uh, lucky stars or blessings or Definitely. whatever. You look at. <laughs> yep. For, uh, yeah. Well, cool. Well, uh, we, since you're an educator, we, we thought a good topic would, uh, to be to discuss, um, you know, methods of educating people, um, specifically in regards to caring for reptiles. You know, uh, I guess the, maybe two sides of the issue would be, 
Um, do we give them kind of the basics, uh, let them figure it out from there? Or can you have successful learning from like, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, like a care sheet or, or a guide, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, so if you, if you're game to, to discuss that topic, I think we'll, uh, absolutely we'll, we'll flip a coin to see who gets to, to fight you <laughs> and then Sounds we'll go good. from there. So. Well, right. Chuck, do you, you, you feeling lucky this week? You want to, I don't know. Or... We'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> All right. Here it goes. Heads. It's heads. You ah, got one, see? man. All right. Well, you get to choose. You want to uh, fight the uh, great Frank Payne or do you I wanna... absolutely will fight the All great right. Frank Payne. Of course. Of good. course. Well, All yeah, right. I'll, I'll be Mr. Moderator today. All right. Well, feel free <laughs> to jump in. Okay, well, we'll let our guest uh, call the next coin toss on to who, yeah. who decide who gets which topic. So, um, um, Chuck won um, one, so you probably got a good chance that you're going to win the next one. <laughs> okay, go ahead uh, and call it. Tails. All right, we got heads. Chuck, oh, Chuck wins wow. two in a row. This is a wow. monumental occasion here. I think Jeez, <laughs> I don't even know. I was I was preparing to lose this one. I yeah. didn't. I don't even know. Like you haven't what, even uh, prepared a response. You, you uh, expected. So, man, I mean, if if I'm if I'm choosing true to my heart, um, I, I I think I will go with the um the the kind of the. The giving less information and letting people figure it outside. I think okay. I, I definitely align that side <laughs> a little bit more. And, um, you know, I think I, I think as far as like debating somebody who uh, kind of I don't want to say does the care sheet. Uh, I think if, if there is the care sheet, nobody does it better than Frank. So I, I feel like this is this is a fair this is a fair right. thing. All right. Sounds good. OK, well, you've each got your topics and Chuck is the winner of two coin tosses in a row we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna let you decide if you want to go first or defer to our guest uh i'll let i'll let frank go first okay okay yeah all right yeah all so right. if you want to kind of give us an introductory uh, statement or you know okay. kind of start us off yeah that'd be great okay um I'm, I'm glad that you won the coin toss actually because i would have had a hard time picking which side <laughs> right. because i i, I yeah. kind of do i have feelings both ways uh but so my, my thing is, is education, you know, the, um, from the beginning when I was a zookeeper, my favorite aspect of being a zookeeper was doing the shows every day. It was doing the lectures with the public. And then eventually I transitioned to public education, working with kids, you know, like I love education. It's something I enjoy. I think it's vitally important. Um, so with, with my experience and with the experience of others, you know, I don't think that should be kept. You know, sometimes we work in silos and sometimes people hoard their knowledge. They don't want to give away trade secrets. Mm -hmm. um, they're afraid that, yeah. you know, it's going to hurt them competitive wise, you know, competition wise. Um, but I take the opposite viewpoint. I, I share literally everything that I learn I, and I try to do so as much as possible. I write, you know, care sheets or articles that I post on my website for free. Uh, you know, quite a few of them have been published in Reptiles Magazine. I've had a couple international ones like, and I do podcasts like this as often as I can because I like, so for two reasons, I like talking about it from a selfish point of view mm -hmm. um, and, and writing about it. And, you know, I want people to have uh, as great of a, a chance of success with these animals that I love, especially animals that I breed. I want to write something and give as much education as possible about what I breed because I care about these animals I want, I want them to be successful. I don't want them to start off with a poor quality um, care sheet or a starting point. I want them to start off with as good of information as I can provide. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Chuck, you got a response to that? That's a, that's I do, a pretty I strong do. Uh, opening statement. It is, and it is good. Uh, and, and I, and I, you know, for, for that part, I agree. I, um, you know, and I think that uh, th definitely, you know, when, when uh, you're, trying to help somebody who's just starting to keep a species, there's definitely a good place for that. And, and, um, I think, you know, giving people a solid foundation, um, and, and you know, I think I, as somebody who started out not knowing anything and, and moved through a progression, uh, I, I found that, you know, learning that natural history and taking that and then applying that natural history to my keeping was something that, that was hugely informative. And, and I needed that, that starting point, but, you know, I think 
the the pit the potential pitfall of you know just giving somebody the care sheet or just giving them the the formula so to speak is that they stop at that point and 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 not necessarily everybody i don't want to put everybody in a box but yeah. you know if 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 if, if, you know, you just kind of say this is here is the four walls that you need to operate in. People don't look outside those walls. And and maybe, you know, um, what works for Frank in in Pennsylvania may not work for me in San Diego, you know. And so people need to have that, the, you know, need to be kind of tracking on that and be articulate about what they're doing outside of that informative care sheet uh, that, that maybe they start with. So I think, you know, kind of having that that base but also you know being being experimental uh within within reason and using good sound judgment and logic is is probably you know gonna serve people and and i think you know we see that now with a lot of the way we keep uh keeping has gotten better because i think people have started to do some of that mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and, and that that's that's all true. Um, you know, that's all good stuff. Uh, you know, nothing wrong with any of that. Um, but I, there are a couple points, you know, that I will counter there. Um, is you know, thirty years ago, twenty five years ago, when I was just starting, you know, it it wasn't from scratch. Like you know, Philippe de was was a childhood hero of mine. You know, what I mean, like I was a reptile yeah. nerd as a kid. You know, his little manuals, his little vivarium series books and, and magazine articles, you know, like I devoured them. I read them again and again. There was, you know, I'm a chameleon guy and there was a couple of good chameleon books um, out of Europe, out of Henkel and Schmidt. And I still have them and you can barely open the things because they've been read so many times. <laughs> awesome. And, you know, you look at those things now and like – I hear people say all the time, like, oh, my God, that's so outdated. The information is so bad. I'm like, well, no, well, not really. That was just what we knew at the time. That was the mm -hmm. best we could do at the time. They were, it was a great starting point. And I think that anybody that's being honest with themselves that writes or that um, that educates in any way when it comes to captive care, it's that whatever we produce and put out there, like, it's not etched in stone. It's not a stone tablet. It's a living document. It's, it's progressive. You know, I base my entire reptile, um, career, hobby, whatever you want to call it on the, uh, being progressive on trying to improve myself every single year, get better and better and better. You know, I need to go back and rewrite some of my care sheets that I wrote five years ago because a mm -hmm. lot, some of the stuff doesn't apply anymore. So that's, that's the one point. And the other point I'll say is I do agree that natural learning the natural history of the animals and visiting their habitats, especially if you can, is important, is very useful. But what I'm starting to see now is people using theoretical knowledge and, and using applying data from nature and trying to make strict husbandry recommendations out of it. And husbandry, you know, reptile husbandry, especially indoor keeping, yeah. is not what these animals are experiencing in the wild. And we are not even going to remotely come close to it. They aren't the same thing. And I think that yeah. what I'm starting to see too much is like, you know, I think that there's very much a place for understanding nature and where these animals actually come from. But I feel like people are starting to put too much emphasis on that in that there's no no allowance for the captive environment. And it's just like, mm. make it like nature, make it like nature. I'm like, well, yeah, that's great and everything, but we're not outdoors. Yeah. You know, I'm in my, I'm in my basement in Pennsylvania. That's not physically possible, you know, and there are certain things that we can, but certain things that we can, and maybe some things that we shouldn't. Frank, um, um, can I jump in and just kind of ask yeah, maybe please. an example of how you see it, you know, maybe an example of a disconnect between natural history and, and how, you know, you might keep something or. Uh, um, sure. So chameleons, for instance, mm -hmm. um, some of the chameleons, you know, everybody thinks of a chameleon as a tropical animal and that's yeah. not always the case, right? That's very, very often not the case. Um, and one of the things I'm seeing, seeing in chameleon husbandry is like, well, these are the climatic conditions in nature. We have to recreate that in the the hobby and so for instance like a species like first for lateralis uh, the carpet chameleon mm -hmm. you know 
they might be ex exposed to extreme temperatures, seasonal swings in the wild that, I, you know, I've played around with these animals outdoors in different conditions and inside in some of those conditions, which they might experience in nature, I've found them to not do well with in captivity, mm -hmm. temperature wise, humidity wise, moisture wise, you know, like yeah. I, these animals, I, some like probably live a season, probably live a year. You know, they, they are, they hatch, they're born and they, they're laying eggs within four five, six months. And yeah. I always and call them have, the, then, the insects of the reptile world, you know, they just, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's in some people that turn some people off, but for uh -huh. me, that's, it's just so rewarding. You know, it's just a fast uh -huh. thing and it's just, I, yeah. I enjoy that. Um, <laughs> but so that's, that's one particular area. Um, yeah, no, that's a great example. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's like what I hear the most about. And like, you know, we talked a little bit um, about like the whole calcium thing, like leaving calcium dishes in with geckos. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've heard people say as well that that's bad for them. That's that you shouldn't do that. Um, but you know, like my counter argument is like with the William side, the Ligodactylus William side, the electric blue geckos I produce, you know, I produced over a thousand of those animals and mm -hmm. every single one of them, the breeding pair has a dish of pure calcium in it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, people message me all the time to troubleshoot for Ligodactylus williams, I, my female's not doing well, my babies are dying, et cetera. And, uh, and my first question is like, has the female had access to pure calcium 24 mm seven? -hmm. And in, in, in so many cases, no, they haven't. Mm -hmm. And then they switch over to that. And all of a sudden the, the babies are doing better. The moms mm -hmm. don't crash and burn after a few eggs. Is that natural to have a dish of pure calcium laying around? No, it's not. Of course not. But what I'm doing in captivity isn't natural either. You know, I mean, I have to, you know, I'm obviously missing something that they're getting in the wild because sure. mm -hmm. they're not getting a pure calcium dish, you know, <laughs> yeah. 24 7. Yeah. Of course not. Of course. Mm -hmm. so, but, they, you know, there is something that I'm missing, even though I'm providing high quality UV light, automatic misting systems, you know, what I mean, like, bioactive but we're, but we're probably not replicating their full um you know dietary no. <laughs> intake from the wild of course either, not so. yeah of yeah. course not like i'm yeah. you know give them the high quality gecko diets as many feeder species as i can give them that's you know size appropriate i do all that you know i gut load as best i can of course that's another topic too right <laughs> um and i dust and everything but it for me that's like there are, there are safety nets that you can give in captivity that maybe aren't natural, mm -hmm. but may, and maybe will be harmful in certain circumstances. Yeah. But in most cases provide a little bit of an extra padding for people that maybe can't read their animals really well. Don't have the experience to do so. That's a, no, that's a great example. One, sorry, Chuck, I'm going to jump. No, you're here. good. Yeah, run, roll, just kind of no, ask good, another, another, uh, question. So just, um, as, as a, you know, a practical uh, question in regards to the calcium bowls, how do you keep it with that, you know, from clumping or from getting bad really quick, you know, do you, do you have to replace yeah, it good. frequently or, you know, especially in um, a humid environment? Yeah. So I've, there's two basic things that I do, uh, to make sure, um, that it works is mm -hmm. so a, it's in a dish that is placed in a location in the terrarium that is not hit by the automatic misting system. Sure. So location is important. If it gets hit by water, it's going to turn into a brick. <laughs> yeah, right? Way, way yeah. high. I put it up high that way. It's <laughs> yeah. Above. Mm -hmm. I tend to put it honestly, I, you know, because I don't have like such, you know, I don't do like the suction cup thing. I'm getting kind of lazy, I guess. And mm -hmm. I just shove it in the corner like where the misting nozzle is on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So it's directly yeah. underneath the misting nozzle. The misting nozzle is pointing forward. So it physically can't have water on it. Yeah. Um, so I usually put it there. Um, and then I, I do change it like twice a month, Okay, but that's it. You know, hmm. no big deal. I just dump it out, replace it. Um, and as long as it doesn't get wet, it stays reasonably powdery um, for that length of time. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Just kind of an aside. I was just curious about that. Yeah. Talking mm -hmm. about that. Cool. Yep. All right, Chuck. You, you, uh, sure I, I forgot what I was going to say. You <laughs> sidetracked me. No, no. Oh, um, you, you can blame no, me anytime, but I, I, I just, I just did. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I all, all it, it, excellent points. I mean, I think, you know, um, why I'm, I, I like the side of kind of, 
like I said, the natural history, but yet letting people figure it out. And, and, you know, I think all three of us, I mean, I would like to hope I have more of a scientific mind where I, where I try to take all of the factors that are at play, um, you know, in nature and then bring them inside because at some level they do exist inside, but, but, they're not the same. You don't have the same biotic factors happening even inside a, um, you know, a bioactive enclosure as you do out in nature. Um, you may have some of the same governing effects, but, but they don't operate necessarily the same way. So if you keep it too moist or you, you know, you're not, um, kind of really engaging in what's going on. And, And I think that's kind of where I would, I would say, you know, the the being articulate and and really thinking through um whereas like you know if you were to like i said just take that four walls of a care sheet and and stick to that uh where you will definitely run into trouble and i think that 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 people who end up doing that eventually end up walking away from the care sheet because they they're not thinking through stuff and and they're they're not watching what's happening and making changes so when things do go awry they're like ah this is bad what happened and they have a bad outcome and then that forces them to do that and that bad outcome reinforces oh i can't just think about the care sheet so it's it's you know it's learning it's learning that mistake in that painful way um uh no pun intended frank uh and and (laughs) And, and I've heard so, them all. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, my first name's Chuck, so you know I, I, I've heard I've heard quite a few of them uh, at the expense of myself too. So, um, but so so you know just just kind of that 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 idea that um, certainly you have to start somewhere and you have to kind of think about it. But but on that back end, really thinking through what's going on and and kind of you know we talk about uh, being a student of the serpent since. We, we, you know, we all kind of started as carpet python guys. Uh, so, you know, just kind of really engaging with what what's happening with your animals. Um, and I think, you know, for me, that's the biggest part of it. And, and but undeniably, you have you have to have a base to kind of start from. And and if you didn't know, you need somebody. And I think I agree. I hundred percent agree with you that 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 base education is somebody there who and obviously like you know, some of these things you didn't come up with, you, you learn from other people. So I think, you know, we all stand on the backs of giants, uh, and, and we all learn from each other. And, and, you know, what, what was in books 10 years ago, people look at and say, well, no, we don't do that anymore. Well, yeah, that's, that's right. We don't, but we learned, you know, from that. Right. And, and you have to get, you you know, like any car ride, you have to start somewhere and you end up somewhere else. So, um, I think that's kind of what I would say, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I mean, I think that's like a great argument for my side. <laughs> 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 so I appreciate that because okay. like, again, like I stood on the shoulders of the giants of the generation before me, I stood on Philippe's shoulders. I stood on Hank and Schmidt's shoulders. And now I'm already seeing a new generation of keepers standing on mine. Right. The, the fact that I've given this education, the fact that the generation before me gave me an education, I was able to take that and make progress and push forward. And now I'm already seeing like I have a friend, uh, Michael Nash, you know, he's taking up carpet chameleons, too. And he's figuring out stuff. Now I'm learning from him. But he started with something, you know, from keepers that came before him. And if there wasn't that free sharing of knowledge, whether it is just a care sheet or a YouTube video or a podcast or whatever. But without that, you know, this is the current state of our understanding. You know, this is the best of what I'm doing. This is a great place to start. And then, yeah, people were going to start off with, you know, the strictures of that, the four walls. Um, But like that, again, that's a starting point and that's a place to go forward and make progress. And if there weren't people maybe kind of hand holding a little bit, maybe kind of spoon feeding information like I do, you know, I'm a teacher at heart, you know, I, and I maybe a little bit too, um, you know, too free with it, but like without that spoon feeding of knowledge that would, they wouldn't have a place to go from. And then there, and there wouldn't be as much progress. Like, yeah, there'd be progress. People would figure things out on their own. But again, like, you know, that's the course of human history, right? Um, you know, the, a jet wasn't, you know, invented overnight, you know, there was like 
the Wright brothers and, you know, there was horse and buggy, you know what I mean? Like it just, that's the way progress works. It's not just one person figuring it all out. We have to, to teach each other and share and go from generation to generation. Sure. Sure. I mean, I, I, I don't think we're, I actually don't think we're really disagreeing on that um, (laughs) at all. Uh, You know, I, I think, I, I think just in, you know, where I'm coming from is, is more the idea that you're, you're right. You you do have to kind of put that knowledge out there. So people, um, you know, and, and it, and it's more of like how the process works or how the process should work. Right. And I think, you know, the idea that somebody has to be the teacher, somebody has to impart what they know and give people a place to take, you know, that starting point and move out. And, and, and hopefully they come back and they're sharing what they experienced. And, and, you know, like to, to, to the, to the whole calcium thing. And, and, you know, uh, I, I think it all started, you know, Justin was talking to somebody who said, no, actually that they've seen, you know, animals OD on calcium or something like that. And so, no, that's actually not a great practice. And, and, you know, I, I think the, the question came up, like, has that been studied? Is that scientifically tested? Uh, what, where is your backing for this? And, and I think, you know, I, I mean, I, I, although anecdotally, I think you have great backing for that because how you know you've been extremely successful with Williams Eye and you you give it to them. So, I mean, w- well, well, ev- like as a human being, if we can quantify it with science, it's better, right? But don't results always speak for themselves? I mean, you know, if, if you can do it and you don't see ill effects, does that mean somebody won't have an ill effect? Does that mean that that ill effect was directly resulted from the calcium or was there something else going on that they mistakenly associated with that? So again, mm-hmm. it goes back to being articulate and thinking about what's really, what's happening. And, and sometimes you'll never know, but, but, also being careful not to rush to that judgment, staying open to the idea. And, and like you say, you know, sharing, I think that's one of the huge parts of this is if you're not sharing the the insights that you've had, then, you know, um, you're missing probably the best part of, of what we all do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Can I yeah. Uh, jump in again here? I, uh, I yeah, was, please do, because I agreed with literally everything yeah. you just said. So I have no counter. No, we, yeah. we go from fight club to mild <laughs> disagreement club, because a lot of times we end up it's it's and this is a hard thing to to, you know, d- dis- find things to disagree about when where there's so much agreement in, in the conversation. So, um, you know, it's it's it can yeah. be tough. Sometimes it even goes to Kumbaya Club, but yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, we're kind of we're kind of pointed that way, but Chuck. And so you know, I, I like you know what you're talking about in regards to you know sometimes we get misinterpretations, and so maybe you know the calcium OD thing was not truly just calcium. Maybe it was mm-hmm. calcium and vitamins, and they were giving them too much, you know, so of one yeah. thing or another. So, so um, for it, yeah, it, like maybe I'm sorry, it was just like the calcium mm-hmm. thing, like like yeah, maybe they autopsy necropsy the animal and there was a calcium overdose maybe it was in fact but then maybe the, that animal wasn't getting the heat that it needed mm-hmm. maybe it wasn't getting enough uv light to process that calcium into d3 yeah. maybe it didn't have enough water to hydrate itself you know i mean yeah so just yeah, uh there's a lot of a lot of things in mm-hmm. so so, so i guess my question my question for chuck was like how do you vet uh you know that information how do you know what to test i guess is the question you know I mean, that's kind of tough. I, I, you know, I, I, I mean, it's one of those things where there's so much going on, uh, all at once that that's kind of, isn't that kind of the tough spot, right? Where you, where you, you know, you, you almost kind of never know. And I mean, in, 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 even in a scientific study, um, you can do pretty well, but even still, I mean, you see scientific studies that are absolutely done exactly the same way and they get absolutely different results. So even reproduction, uh, under identical standards does not always work out the same way. So I'd say that's tough. You know what I mean? And I think you have to do with the best you can, but reproducibility and, and consistency. And I think probably Frank would agree with me that he works in a very consistent and a very reproducible way uh, and gets very good results. When, when I tell people, uh, yeah, I have to completely agree. Um, so when I tell people like, and why I say like, okay, why should I listen to you? But when I read this other care sheet that says something completely different and the most important thing in herpticulture 
and you, you mentioned this already, Justin, I think, um, is results. You know, results is, is, is basically all that matters. Results trump, trumps theory. Mm-hmm. Results trumps, um, you know, natural conditions where the animal comes from. If you're producing hundreds of a, of a species a year that very few other people are producing and with near 100% uh, success rate, like, what, what's, what's the argument there? You know what I mean? Like what's, where's the, the, the debate about whether you should or shouldn't use, do something in, in that way. You know, like that's what it's all about is the fact that if you can do something like that year after year after year, you know, with a very high success rate, well then that, that's really all that matters more than anything else, more than a new study that's come out that says this, you know, like reptile lighting is, is obviously, you know, something that's evolving and is obviously very important, but mm-hmm. it is, it's a tough pill for me to swallow when, you know, somebody that's usually significantly younger than me tells me <laughs> that, you know, this lighting is the lighting I'm doing is wrong, that this lighting, it has to be this way, that this is the best lighting. And I'm like, yeah. all right, well, I got a thousand endangered blue geckos that won't necessarily agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, and I, you I know, feel, because, I, you know, and I, I, I I wrestle with the idea that it, this is a, a you know a hobby uh, or a community as well as um, y- you know a, a business and an industry, right? And and so mm. you know lighting is a, and and we're getting better with lighting. There's there's new lighting technologies that are coming along, or people are trying to develop these new technologies. And along with these new technologies comes the mantra of oh you got to use this because it's better and 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 so you know, everybody's doing their work in quotes to say, ah, this is what we need to do because it's the best. And, and, and everybody may come out with a different result. And then people are left to be like, well, wait, what is, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. And it, that's kind of like, I I feel like that it's a, it's a good way to kind of express where we're at with, with a lot of uh, lighting right now is, is, um, there's just, and, and, you know, it's all, Hey, it, new technologies are great. And I, I think that the more we can push forward, the better it is, but sorting all that out and making some real insights as to it, what really is the better, uh, isn't the easiest thing. No, definitely not. And it's just, and the thing that I try to put out in my education as much as I can is your results may vary. You know, I say, this is what works for me. This does not guarantee you success. You know, this is, you know, what I have found to work. I'm not saying it's the best way. I've never said that about anything I've ever done with these animals or anything that I've ever put out there. I've never said this is the best way or this is the only way because we all know there is no only way, especially when it comes to dealing with complex biological systems, which is basically what we're doing. There is no one way and Maybe there is a best way, but man, it's so hard to pin down. You know, like, like you said, we we don't – so many times we don't know what the actual answer is. We can get our best guess. We can narrow it down maybe, but we really don't know. It could be a million different things. And, you know, that does drive people nuts sometimes that ask me for help. It's like this – my animal died. My animal is sick. This issue is occurring. What is it? And then my answer is usually – I don't know, you know, and, and they don't, they don't like that. They're like, well, you're the expert. You're supposed to be able to tell me these things. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, like well, I wish and, I could tell you. And I mean, I always just tell people like, well, this is what has worked for me. This is my yeah. experience. This is my understanding. And I've had stuff that, you know, I felt like, oh, I made an insight. But, you know, if other people don't have success with it, is it an insight or was it just what worked? You know, I don't know. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I have a really hard time giving advice to people who ask me anything because I feel like it's such a subjective thing. Now, you know, mm-hmm. obviously I have not produced a thousand Williams. I, if I had done that, I would feel a little more confident about the words that I speak. And I mean, certainly <laughs> you have quite a bit of uh, more experience uh, under your belt uh, than I do, but you know, I, I definitely think that it's, it's, it is a, you know, you're always learning and things are always changing. And you're, you're, you know, if you're napping on your keeping, you're going to have problems. You always mm-hmm. have to be engaged every day, all the time. And, and you know, 
the bigger your collection, I think the harder it is, uh, the more diverse your collection, the harder it is. Cause you're, you know, you're trying yeah. to do so many different things. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and I've, you know, said, I try to base my reptile keeping on a, a progressive nature. Like if I'm, if I'm doing exactly what I'm doing now, five years from now, then I failed, then I have not, you know, even if I've, you know, still continue to produce animals, like I've, I've still failed in a way. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And kind of, well, I'm going to kind of like switch gears a little bit because something just occurred to me uh, about like, in terms of the education side of things. And so in terms of a positive for putting that information out there and I'll be honest, it's strictly selfish. It saves me a ton of time. Hmm. So I write articles on the things that I, that I breed and that I sell so that when it comes time for that someone purchases it, they get a link to an article, they get a link to a YouTube video. This is what I do. And so when somebody, and then if somebody asks me a question, which I'll get dozens of questions about certain animals a day or a week, whatever, here's the link to my article, read it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, you know, instead of trying to answer, it, it's a strictly selfish thing from a breeder's point of view, because I physically don't have time to answer the detailed questions. I can't tell, I can't teach someone one-on-one -on -one how to care for these animals, which is kind of my responsibility to do as a breeder. I'm responsible for the animal and for their hopeful success. And so by having something prepared ahead of time, that saves me in a ton of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's like kind of putting everybody on the same base of knowledge so that if you do have to spend time, it's not, you know, going back from square one and trying to, mm -hmm. you know, trying to inform people. And I, and I think, you know, to, to, to your point, um, you know, if you're, if you're having success in an area, you know, uh, AZA organizations don't, they don't care unless you're published, right? They want to see that data published. They want it out there. Yep. They want other people to have that success. And then they're like, oh, that's credibility. That that right there is. So there's definitely a place and a need um, for for people to, you know, do do. And and care sheet is such a I don't know. I You know, to I don't to, like it. Yeah. Either. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 you know, yeah. I think it's I, I think. I think we all kind of understand what we're saying when we say the word care sheet, but I, I don't, sure. I wouldn't necessarily consider a lot of what you're doing, Frank, as, as care sheet, right? You know, it's, it's certainly education in a written form, but I mean, education is, is in a written form sometimes. That's how we, yep. you know, that, that's one of the great things about being a human. <laughs> so, <laughs> what's the, what's the zoo term for the care sheet? <laughs> Is it like oh. BC's operating plan or something like that? I mean, um, well, I know SSP, I know the term, which but is, yeah. I mean, SSP is species plan. survival plan. That's for like obviously endangered species, um, but that's not usually, I mean, uh, a publication, I think is what uh, they would say. Um, like because like a lot of, a lot of, zoo, well, most zoos for, for species they keep, right? They, don't they have to have kind of a document that says, this is how this mm -hmm. animal is cared for. And this is, mm -hmm. so I mean, Absolutely. Zoos I would use, imagine there uh, has to be a standard, a, a uniform standard of care, yeah, you know, that's, that's agreed upon. That's a yeah. su successful way to, to, and, and yep. I, again, those are probably uh, moving targets to some extent, but for the most part, they probably remain the same uh, over the, Depends on the species for certain and like the more zoo, common probably. species. Yeah. That's yeah, in the zoo for sure. Mm -hmm. But like, like there are certain species. Like there are there are documents you know that are shared. Like this is how we do it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I've read quite a few of those. Um, you know, for animals that I've kept privately, then where, um, like for instance, uh, Phrynosoma um, mm -hmm. asio. You know, like when I was the keeping Mexican those for a little lizards. bit. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like the giant ones and. You know, there is the only good information I could find was uh, in a zoo journal mm -hmm. and it was great. It was, but here's the thing. I mean, it was no different than what I write or than, you know, what any other, you know, educator writes about taking care of animals. Yeah. But yeah, so that's, you know, they, they I think they just call it publication. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, well, I know uh, um, I was talking to Alan Rapashi and, you know, kind of figuring out like, how do you do all this? Like, how are you, how do you have this, uh, 
you know, crested gecko empire type business type thing, but then you're going and doing all these other things. And he said he basically worked out, you know, the, the care that was required. He hired a bunch mm -hmm. of uh, people that ne weren't even really into reptiles, but he made the, the care yeah. guide clear enough that they could care for them properly. And then he'd come in, mm -hmm. you know, periodically to check on the animals and make sure that things were being done properly and, and makes changes or adjustments. And, and, mm -hmm. and he said it worked f fantastically. He's like, one of the things I never do is hire a reptile person because they, they, one, they think they know point. better. And two, mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to follow, you know, your plan. And two, they'll, they'll oftentimes try to take animals home with it, you know, or mm. eggs home or something kind of steal from you sometimes. So yeah, that was I believe interesting. That. So like the counterpoint to that is you can do that with crested geckos. You can't do that with a lot of stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you could come up with a, a, a simple protocol that a non reptile person can follow for a crested gecko, for a leopard gecko, for a ball Python, mm -hmm. bearded dragons, you know, a handful of others, I'm sure. But you, you can't do that with a, you can't do that with a carpet chameleon. I mean, those yeah. darn things th th throw me for a loop every once in a while. You know, uh, first of all, minor, a related uh, endangered species. I, I've, I've produced more of those than anyone in this country, uh, maybe in the world. Hmm. And I had an awful season this year. Man, they kicked my butt. You know, I had all sorts of female reproductive issues. Like, you know, it, it's, and I'm, and I'm just like limping through right now, hoping <laughs> to pick things back up. Where, but for like several years, I, I had to stop breeding them. I was producing too many where I wouldn't be able to handle it anymore. You know, so, so that's for some species, you know, like the more common stuff and the hardy stuff like crested geckos, leopard geckos, ball pythons. But yeah, you can't do that with everything. Hmm. When I try to do like with my wife, who's now um, the primary uh, caretaker of the animal. So like, you know, she takes, does the feeding and the cleaning and whatnot. I wrote protocols that she follows. Like I write hmm. out a check, I wrote out a checklist um, that she follows. I'm doing consulting work for someone else right now where I'm, mm -hmm. I've gone through their reptile room and here are my recommendations. This is what you should do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, if, yeah. you know, et cetera. Like, so that somebody who is not very experienced can go through and do the basic stuff, but like you still need somebody like a supervisor that comes around, like, you know, like Alan said, that comes around and says, okay, this needs to be done a little bit differently for this animal needs this special treatment, you know, and, or at the very least, um, a, a husbandry personal personnel that is willing to learn that and take that on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's definitely, you know, uh, 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 difficult with some species, like you said, you know, I, I'm curious on your, uh, minor chameleons, you know, what did you attribute that, uh, kind of change or, you know, the, the things that you'd been doing, uh, didn't, didn't work so well, or, or was it just uh, individual <sighs> animals or what do you think? No, still it's not, to it. <laughs> yeah. I'm still, I'm, I have, I have ideas. I'm still, it wasn't individual animals. It was like a slew. It was like the most depressing thing that I've ever experienced in this mm -hmm. hobby, in this mm -hmm. industry. It was, gosh, it was awful. And it's, I'm starting to, I think I've kind of correct course corrected a little bit. Um, I changed enclosures, um, and I moved, right. I had a couple mm -hmm. of big moves cause we moved cities completely. And, you know, yeah. especially snake, snake guys, you know, yeah. like mm -hmm. you could, you could keep them in the same rack and move to a different house. And all of a sudden the yeah, snakes won't do what they've yeah. always done. That happened you know? to me and, this last year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I've, I, so there was that. And then I did change enclosures, enclosures, which are, are literally perfect for the geckos and I've had or seem to be fine for some other chameleons, but I don't think that I was getting, I think that there was not enough ventilation. Hmm. Um, I think it, I think it really boiled down to that. Like they just weren't getting as much airflow as they needed. You know, it was fine for them to survive and grow up. And then, you know, with the breeding, the females just crashed and burned either mm -hmm. egg bound or, or when they laid, they, they crashed afterwards. And this mm -hmm. was just bizarre for me because like I worked with this species, like I bought as many when they, they were only imported into this country legally once since 1994. And I got as many of them as I could. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had, and I still have a decent sized group, you know, yeah. fingers crossed. Yeah. And I was also, um, you know, cause I produced quite a few, I, there's a, quite a few out there, a decent amount anyway, with yeah. other keepers that are having some limited success with them. They're not producing good. hundreds of animals, but they are producing them so I can hopefully pick up some more and 
I have mm-hmm. some in a, in a couple of zoos right now and they're starting to have a little success. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I'm, 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 sw- I think enclosures is what, what really buggered mm-hmm. me. So I'm going to switch to something different that I think is more appropriate for them. And fingers crossed this next generation is better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you think you could get to the point where you had a, uh, yeah, survival plan or a species uh, operating plan to, to get it to the point where somebody could just read that and follow it and have success? Or do you um, think there's I mean, just aspects of, of that species that'll never be contained in a plan? That's a good question. That is a um, good question. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, <clears throat> in terms of care, yeah, I think so. In terms of breeding, yeah, I don't know. Mm, I don't know about that. Well, That's their, their, Oh my gosh, like their receptivity windows and like these, and these are animals like where if you feed them, the females, if you feed them a couple too many crickets, they can become obese in such a short amount of time hmm. and, and become egg bound because of it. You have to be so careful with feeding. Wow. Um, it got to the point where I was like, my wife was doing literally everything. I was like, I will feed these female chameleons. Wow. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? So don't feed it because I have to be able to read that animal. I have to be able to look at that animal and, and figure out based on my experience, how many insects should this animal get? How many is too many yeah. and how many is too few? Because it is, is a delicate balancing act with, with some of these chameleons. Yeah, so, so here's, so here's a question for you, Frank. And, and, you know, this kind of goes back to ju- one of Justin and I's friends, Terry Phillip uh, says, you know, there's, there's a debate of if you, if you, you know, put a, a reptile out, it will always make the best choices for itself. Right. Is, mm. is kind of the, the idea. And, and, and I think Terry sometimes would say like, maybe that's not the case. They don't always make the best idea, uh, the best, you know, decisions for themselves. And, and so, you know, w- with what, what all we said, you know, how, how in the wild, like, how, you know, if, if, if what you've seen is they're so sensitive in certain areas and, and you see maybe that they're not always prone, just like humans or any other animal to always make the best decisions when left to their mm-hmm. own devices. What, what, where is that regulation? Or do you think, do you think it's other factors that maybe kind of um, are, are, yeah. are coming in on that? Yeah. I think it's the environment that's regulating these instinctual behaviors. It's like a self-regulation thing or environmental regulation thing. So for instance, like the, the instinct of this animal is to gorge itself. Mm-hmm. because you know f- food may be scarce they may not get food for several weeks so i'm going to gorge myself now because maybe i won't get food for a week maybe this is a an insect hatch that's only going to occur once or twice in a season and i'm going to live off of this forever mm-hmm. chameleons chameleons will burn themselves on a bulb you know they will bask they will cook themselves e- even though they have plenty of room to escape that bulb they will cook themselves they'll burn mm-hmm. themselves um, because I think maybe because they have more extreme temperature swings in the wild. So like they're, they're taking advantage of, of a perceived resource that for them would in, in the wild would be much more limited. Maybe that heat would only exist for an hour a day, mm-hmm. but like here we have like a constant heat lamp on for 12 hours a day and they just don't understand that. Like I've seen chameleons bake themselves. I've seen, um, them burn themselves, um, and even though they 100% could escape, you know, monitor lizards, I've seen that people have the basking bulb too close, you know, and again, it's also like partially because it's unnatural conditions, mm-hmm. you know, what the, when I feed a chameleon, this insect that's been gut loaded, that's been, or full of stuff that's, that's literally like in prime condition, this insect, you know, like it's had all the food it could eat, all the drink it could, it could want. You know, and then it's coated in in vitamins and minerals, and there's as many of them as it wants to eat. You know, so like that's yeah. not that nu- nutrition bomb is yeah. not going to occur in the wild. They don't see not, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they're not getting that. They're getting insects that are half dehydrated and <laughs> yeah. yeah, parasitized. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. So I think that you know what we see with stuff like that is we have, um, you know, a very instinctual creature you know, doing stuff that's advantageous to them in the wild, that's deleterious and in, uh, in captivity in, in certain circumstances. Yeah. 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 Green trees are a great, green tree pythons I, are a great I, example of that. I you know, was thinking that every time they look hungry. That, yeah. They're always yeah. like 
in in ambush position waiting for food mm-hmm. you know and if you fed them every time they look hungry they they get obese really quickly mm-hmm. and yeah. yeah it's pretty crazy yep all right. Well, um, we've t- taken, uh, you know, an hour of your time. We appreciate it. You, let's, uh, maybe have you give kind of a closing, uh, uh, statement and then, uh, Chuck will do the same and we'll, we'll okay. uh, end our fight here. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Well, it was my pleasure to be here. Hour flew by. Really enjoyed the <laughs> yeah, conversation. Yeah. Uh, guys, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, so I guess my closing argument would be is kind of a rehash of some things I've already said is that, you know, in order for us to progress as a community um, in keeping these animals that we all, you know, care about so much, we need to share with each other. We need to provide uh, education to the next generation of keepers um, so that they have that leg up so that they can be successful and so that then they can then push themselves forward and push the hobby forward so that the next generation, when our daughters are, are raising reptiles, that they um you know, they do better than what we're doing right now because of the foundation that we've laid because of the education that, that we've given them. Yeah. yeah. And and we can only do that if the information's out there in a, you know, in a yep. concrete form and not just That's kind of right. floating in our brains, you know, yep. we always call it the bus effect. If, if a bus hits me tomorrow, can somebody come in and replace me at work and do my job, mm-hmm. you know, and, and be successful yep. and keep the man. Keep you got it rough. That, that bus effect that sounds rough at your work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, we get specialized, you know, and you get this yeah, information, sure. and 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 of course, yeah. you're not going to pass all that on, and that's you know impossible. But if you're writing it down and keeping good notes, and you know, mm-hmm. writing down what your experiences are, and you know, that's the that's one of the big reasons I decided to write you know some of the books just to get yep. get it out there and. Um, yeah, that's, well, that's I mean, I think anytime you can, you. you can make, you know, uh, a wide, uh, array of, of, you know, research and information, you know, condensed for somebody and help them, um, you know, that, that's a, that's a huge win for, for, you know, for, for the, for public keepers at large. Right. And, and, uh, yeah, you know, it's, I mean, it's, that's it's absolutely critical. That's the name of the game. And that's why it's, you know, so the work you're doing is so important, you know, to get that, get out there and share it and make it a collaborative effort rather than just a, it's a me thing. You know, it's my, my ego, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like, and, and like I, you know, writing the books, I'm not putting a lot of my own information there. It's standing on the shoulders of giants. It's, it's condensing things that have already been published and, and just might not be accessible to the general public. So, well, and I think, I mean, to be honest, I think Frank is an outstanding example of somebody who freely shares their information has tremendous success and is, and, you know, and is adored and, and, and liked for both of those things. So the idea that you need to hold on to these things as, as a selfish thing in order to be that person or that it, it's yeah. wrong. And, and, you know, to, yeah. to, to, to be that example, I think is outstanding. And, and, uh, you know, I just, you know, I, I come from a long line of teachers. Uh, my wife's a teacher. My mom is a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher. Uh, mm-hmm. and I just think educators are, at, you know, some of the most important people we have in our society. Uh, and so, you know, thank you uh, for that. And, and I, you know, and, and uh, to those people out there, you know, um, go out and, and, and seek people like Frank or, or, or people who are doing great things and, and, you know, measure success and longevity. It's people who are having long-term success. There's a lot of people on, on Facebook, on the internet t- who will tell you what to do. And it, not all information is good information. So you have to be a discerning, um, customer of information. And, um, and, and, and not only that, you gotta be, um, your, your own, you know, you gotta be your own student, uh, and you got to be paying attention in your in your reptile room class and, and watching what your animals are doing, ch- always changing, not always changing things, but changing things correctly on condition. And, and don't be afraid to, you know, stray from the playbook. Maybe don't stray far, but see what that effect is. Learn, you know, make make observations and make changes. Uh, I think as long as you stay safe, um, most of these animals that we keep are are fairly um, resilient and can, can shoulder small amounts of change. Uh, and, and if you see a positive, great, keep doing it. If you don't, don't stop. So, you know, I think, I think just, you know, 
like I said, you know, be always be the student, always be paying attention. I think that's kind of my big, my big, uh, period on the end of this, uh, debate. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, uh, Frank, if people want to learn about your stuff or get in contact with you, where, where can they find you? Sure. Uh, so I do have a website. Uh, it's my business name, living art by Frank Payne, P A Y N E. Um, so I have a website by that name, a, a Facebook business page, an Instagram, and a YouTube channel, which I promise I'll make more videos on eventually. Uh, but it's all living art by Frank Payne. So please uh, check this stuff out. Awesome. Yeah, I highly recommend it. It's it's got some great information. I so I've Thank tried you. to tried to, you know, restrict what I keep to, you know, a certain group or whatever. And then I see your mm-hmm. site and I'm like, maybe I do need to work with chameleons. <laughs> you know, maybe <laughs> I do need and I'm like, no, stop. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's too been, many there's too many great yeah, things for me to be tied cool down the one I can't. Yeah. There's you know, I, I love them all so much, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And and yeah. it's you know, I I guess I um see a lot of a lot of people that you know, have success with something. And then it's kind of like, okay, I've made that notch in my belt and I'm moving on to the next thing. And they, so it's, so it's good, you know, to, it is good to have a lot of experience with a lot of species, uh, kind of for selfish reasons, but also to have long-term success and to share that mm-hmm. with others and to keep the project going. I, I, you know, I go back to Bert Langworth a lot and, you know, his oh, Australian man. water dragon production. And like once, once he passed away, they became very, very difficult to find. Now you have a few oh, people producing them and stuff, but you know, that's, uh, I that's was, a tricky uh, thing. I was very lucky when I was working at the zoo. I did a lot of our animal procurement, and I was mm-hmm. very lucky to to have worked with Bert a few times and get yeah. his Australian water dragons. I just remember the first time we got some for our displays. And I was talking to him, and I was like, "I'd like a couple," of and I'm like, "Well," he's like, "They're this price." I'm like, "All right, well, how do you want me to get this money?" He's like, "No, no, I'll send them to you. You make sure that you, that you like them, and then you can pay me afterwards." Wow. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, Bert. Thank yeah. you. I would just remember what what a wonderful individual, yeah. you know, yeah, with yeah. uh Jewel Jeweled Lacertas, you know, I'm taking yeah. I'd take up now and you know, he's a pioneer of the, of that, those as well. What a great yeah. individual. He pioneered a lot of stuff. And that was the thing too, is, I mean, he would say, Oh, you live in, in Utah. Uh, you, you could probably keep these outside. You ought to try this species or that species. And he's yeah, like, give me so recommendations cool. for stuff I can keep outside year round type thing. So yeah, yeah really cool stuff. But, and it seems like you're following along in that vein of, you know, mm-hmm. uh, similar, similar vein. Right. of Let's, let's make this better and let's, let's do, let's do better. And, and keep them going. So, yeah, good stuff, man. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for coming on. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for having uh, me. Yeah. I, anytime. We'll have to have you back. This is good. We'll yeah, get, definitely. Get topic for you. Yeah. Um. Cool. Well, we appreciate everybody uh, listening, and and hope you got some uh, good insights out of this. I know I did, and and uh, enjoyed the the discussion, even though I didn't get a chuck one a coin toss for crying out loud i guess <laughs> so uh but we'll we'll uh, have another episode for you next week and we'll we'll catch you then thanks for listening all right keep learning Fight Club.